Today's episode is sponsored by the free-to-play game War Thunder. If aircraft hold a special place in your heart, or perhaps you are a fan of those targets that some people call tanks or ships, War Thunder has everything you need. More info on War Thunder later on in the video. So welcome everybody to Military Aviation History. I'm Chris, of course, and we are at the Royal Air Force Museum taking a look at this bad boy. This is, of course, the Short Sunderland, uh, probably one of the most famous aircraft out there. It's a flying boat, of course. And uh, this one that we have in the museum, as always on inside the cockpit, what we're going to do, we're gonna have that walk around on the outside. I'm gonna explain all the details here. Then we go on the lower deck, because yes, this aircraft has two decks. On the lower deck first, I'm gonna explain the ins and out of that. And then exclusively, the Royal Air Force Museum has also opened up the upper deck, which is usually closed off. And we're going to discover that together. I haven't been up there just yet. I don't know exactly what to expect. Well, you know, I've gone through the manual, but we'll see what is actually left over there because the history of this aircraft is quite interesting. Built 1944, this specific one, as a Mark V. And then it flew, of course, those anti-submarine missions that you would expect from a Sunderland to fly over the Atlantic and even into the North Sea. And then in 1951, it was given to the French flew with the Aeronaval for about 10 years, mainly from sort of the, the, uh, that linkage point from Brest over to uh, the North African colonies back then. And uh, then it was given back to the British in 1961 and ended up here at the museum. So let's have a walk around of the Sunderland then, shall we? We're of course going to start up at the nose. Why wouldn't we uh, do it over there? Uh, we have, of course, up front a twin turret. 303 machine guns right there and what's cool with this turret is you can sort of see how it's mounted inside that nose section there all right well it can be retracted almost entirely inside making some space there for somebody to pop out and help with the mooring of the aircraft that's where it would be done if it would be going into a harbor or a seaplane station that's where you would do it and if you go just slightly more up front you'll see this cutout window here right and that can be popped open just slightly. It pops out sort of like this at an angle, right? And that would be the bomb aimer station. And at the same time, we also have the stairs here. Imagine the Sunderland being in the water. You could use these stairs from a boat to then jump inside that opened up turret section of the aircraft. As we then move towards the side, we already see the fixed machine guns, two 303 Brownings on either side. And then taking a step back here, let's have a look up there at the cockpit. Of course, we're going to jump in into the pilot seat very soon, but that cockpit is there and the tear-shaped tear -shaped device behind it, that would be the directional finding antenna. Right, now this is gonna be a bit of a challenge to film because of course, as you've already seen, I am being absolutely dwarfed by this aircraft and filming, especially the wing, is going to be a bit of a challenge, but I'm sure Josh, the cameraman, is up to the task. So. Let's talk a little bit about what we find in the wing and on the wing. First off, you see those hatches there on the leading edge, right? The one that almost touches the wing at uh, the fuselage, at the wing root. That's where your auxiliary power unit would be housed. And then the hatch next to that, on either side, in fact, of the, the engines, uh, both the inner engine and the outer engines, you will find a platform that can be folded out just like so creating this, well, this platform for you to immediately access the engines for to, to do some maintenance. Because obviously you can imagine if this aircraft sits uh, on, on the open surface of the sea and you want to work on those engines, you can't really demount them. So you, uh, you open up those hatches and you have a nice little platform to work from. The engines themselves then, these are Pratt and Whitney R1830s-90Bs. Uh, now this plane originally when it came out, came out with Dash 65s. They were re-engined then to the Dash 90Ds. And those produce around about 1,200 horsepower at the highest setting. Max setting would be running sort of at 2,700 RPMs and with a boost of plus nine on your pounds per square inch. What is interesting with these engines, as you see them now in their current configuration, right? let's maybe have a look at the outer engine here as well. They are being driven, well, not the engine is being driven, but the, the, the propellers that you have there are free-bladed constant speed Hamilton hydromatic propellers. So these are fully favorable, which is a big step up from the initial engines that the Sunderland used. The initial engines were the Bristol Pegasus, and I believe the propellers back then were the Havilland propellers, and those couldn't be fully favored. Now imagine you're out on the, over the ocean, you're over the Atlantic, and you're shutting one of these engines down to save on fuel and also on the, on the uh, engine hours and you cannot feather the prop. 
not really an ideal thing because what essentially happens if you don't favor the prop, it doesn't have its sleekest profile towards the wind and you have, in essence, free air brakes just sitting there uh, causing all sorts of mayhem to the pilot, to the, the controls and of course also to the aerodynamics. Now, between the engines then, you see those two air intakes. Those are for the oil coolers. Each engine in the nacelle behind the engine has an oil reservoir of 130 liters. Those oil reservoirs used to in the early Sunderlands to be self-sealing. In the later Sunderlands, uh, they were no longer self-sealing. I'm not quite sure why that change came about. I assume maybe it has to do something with the capacity of the tank. Usually when you make a tank self-sealing, the capacity of the tank goes down. Or perhaps it was just realized that it wasn't really needed to have those as self-sealing. The aircraft themselves in the wing has five fuel tanks and they're set up in a three uh, forward and two rear tanks. So you have the forward inner tank, which is the biggest one, and they get progressively smaller as you go towards the outer tank and then the two rear tanks in the back. Together, a uh, 1,300 gallons, yes, 1,300 gallons per wing. Double that, of course, it's mirrored on the other side. You get 2,600 gallons of fuel, which is pretty good. Of course, Sunderlands would be flying missions over the open ocean that would take anywhere about, well, upwards of 10 hours, 12 hours. So you do need that range and that fuel, and that's essentially endurance, long range endurance. Okay, having done sort of the, this inner portion of the wing now with the engines, let us move over to the uh, wing tip. There's a couple of cool features there as well with the Sunderland. So if you would just follow me, what we see here, of course, is the float. That is, of course, required because if the Sunderland sets down in the open ocean or in the water or in a lake, what you don't want is it to tip over to one side, right? So these floats nicely balance it out on the, uh, on the water surface. Then on the leading edge, if you look at the outer wing all the way to the wingtip, the leading edge is heated and that prevents uh, I think to accumulate on the wing. Again, imagine you're on over the Atlantic. It's not really the best of times. Uh, for, well, there's a war going on, of course, but the weather is not very good. It's cold. It's maybe some of the winter months. You can very quickly have an accumulation of ice, especially if you're flying at high, higher altitudes as well. So that prevents that. And, and, and it's a nice little feature in the sun, I would say. This bulge that you see there is of a more modern anti-surface vessel uh, detection radar. In, during World War II, what you would generally expect to find there are sort of, sort of these, these antenna that look almost like deer anthers, right? Coming out just around the wingtip. In fact, I, I might be mistaken here, but you sort of see that hatch on the leading edge there. There's a small, small ha hatch there. I believe that's where it was typically mounted. Of course, you have also the navigational light to the, on the wingtip. And then if we swing it over, Let's have a look at that massive aileron. Now that is one big aileron. Extends all the way from the wingtip over to the midsection of the wing where it meets the flaps. It's a one piece aileron with no variable trim setting. The pilot cannot trim out this aircraft in the roll axis. However, you do see those two fixed uh, aileron tabs there. Those could be used to already have a fixed trim setting before you actually take off. And then we look at the flaps. The flaps are special in the Sunderland because these are gouge type flaps. Now, what are gouge type flaps? Basically, uh, you know Fowler flaps, right? They, they sort of extend on rails going outwards, increasing that wing, uh, wind, um, the wing area, and then they droop down and that increases the curvature of the wing. Well, gouge type flaps, what we have here, they immediately sort of curve down as they're being extended on rails, right? which increases the wing surface area and immediately also the curvature. Now, as far as I know, with these flaps right here, they were only used by the short company because they were invented by somebody who worked for the short company. And of course, with the amount of aircraft that were produced throughout time and space, it is possible that there is an exception to this. But as far as I know, the Sunderland is essentially one of the only aircraft that has these types of flaps. I believe the Short Sterling has them as well, and maybe one or two other aircraft from the Short Company. If you know of an aircraft that has exactly these type of couch, uh, gouge flaps, um, that, and I haven't named it just now, then please let me know, and uh, because that would actually be interesting, because you never know, there's so many aircraft that were produced, and sometimes you find these weird, uh, uh, weird uh, coincidences in, in, in the designs. Right, moving a little bit further towards the fuselage now, 
next to the depth charges that you see right there, we're going to talk about sort of the Bombay one score inside. So I'm not going to be uh, uh, talking about them just yet. But you see those three lights there that face downwards. Those are the downwards identification lights where you could get into contact with sort of uh, surface uh, objects like ships or in fact uh, land-based objects as well and identify yourself or send coded signals and so forth. Right, let's step back again because now we have to take a look at the fuselage and yes it is going to be a little bit of a challenge to film this but maybe at this angle here we can first of all see the inopportune placement of our camera bags but if you look sort of at the top half of the aircraft you see a little bulge there and that's where the mid upper turret was originally housed i was taken off I, i'm not quite sure if it was taken off by the british or by the french or maybe later on when, when it was returned to the british uh, but that turret would generally be housing uh, two 303 machine guns again. Again, 303 machine guns for the, those people that prefer a metric system. That's essentially a 7.7 millimeters, yeah, it's a rifle caliber machine gun. All turrets, by the way, are hydraulically operated. And now I just realized that I forgot to talk about something, namely the placement of the generators and the hydraulic pumping system, all right? So in the outer engine of the Sunderland, that's where the uh, pumps would be for the hydraulic system. And they would power for example, turrets, but also the flaps, whereas the electrical generators would always be on the inner engine. So you have that nice little, uh, nice little division of labor there between the engines. But there is, of course, as there always is, an exception to this because the starboard inner engine also houses an additional pump for the hydraulic system as well. So what do you have in the Sunderland? To sum it up, you have two electrical generators in the inner, inner, inner engines and you have three hydro uh, hydraulic pumps, two in the outer engine and one in the starboard inner one. All right, so with having done my homework on that thing, let's go further towards the rear of the fuselage where you see the antenna sticking out of the rear just in front of the vertical stabilizer. On some of the older pictures, especially from World War II, you see again sort of spikes coming out there, antenna coming out. Not like these, more, more, uh, more vertically aligned and a couple of them in a row. And that would be where the main, uh, main antenna would be for the uh, anti-surface vessel radar set, right? So, I believe the Sunderlands went from the Mark II set all the way to the Mark IV, Mark V set uh, with, with those antennae. Right, towards the rear then, again, this is going to be a bit of a challenge to film here, I believe, but the leading edges of both the horizontal and the vertical stabilizer are also heated to once again prevent that accumulation of ice. We have the elevator and the rudder, of course. These are variable uh, trim, these have variable trim tabs. Both of them, in fact, the rudder has two of them, one higher one and one lower one. You see there is a little hatch next to the turret. That's the escape hatch for uh, the rear gunner, which is nice because along a lot of British bombers, for example, let's assume that, let's take the Halifax as an example, because I have a video about that one as well. The rear gunner had a hard time getting out of, uh, out of the, uh, the aircraft sometimes. So theoretically, you could rotate the turret to 90 degrees and then open the hatches behind you and jump out, or you had to get out of the, out of the uh, turret and then run all the way to the mix section of the Halifax and bail out there. But here on the Sunderland, the chap can get out immediately. Of course, that turret as well, that's where the main defensive firepower of the Sunderland would be located. Four free or free machine guns, uh, giving some hefty defensive firepower there if it's dueling out against, for example, German heavy fighters or uh, bombers made into sort of heavy fighters over the Atlantic, especially duking it out, of course, with KG-40 there being located in the north of France. Right, let's loop around then. As you can see, the way the Sunderland is sort of positioned right now, it's being uh, put on these stilts. But you can also see where some of uh, the rear, uh, the rear, uh, on the rear position there, where you could position those wheels in order to then ferry it out onto a land and outwards. And you also have uh, uh, fairings to actually attach wheels on either side. I will get to that in just a second. But as we then loop around completely, by the way, I should mention as well, the Royal Air Force Museum, if you come visit London, do check out. This is an absolutely prime location to see aircraft just like the Sunderland. And it's free entry, mind you, it is free entry. But of course, if you're coming here, why not you know, go to the restoration area or go and pass by at the gift shop as well. Museums do deserve our support, I do believe. Now, I'm not gonna to talk too much about the port side wing, simply because it's essentially mirroring what is available on the starboard side. But there is a little bit of an exception, namely that these two, what looks like hatches now, they have been painted over. 
those would be the position of the landing lights, two big massive landing lights there. And if we swing it all the way to the uh, leading edge uh, wing route here, that's where usually it's been closed off now. I don't know who did that. Maybe the French, maybe the British afterwards. That's where the air intake would be for the air conditioning unit of the Sunderland. Right, so that rounds up us up on the outside. We are going to jump inside now, discovering first the lower deck. Now, you, typically, when you come to the Air, Royal Air Force Museum, you have to get into the uh, aircraft from the starboard side, right? Because that's where the entrance is. And the exit is here on the port side, front port side hatch. But because I'm a little bit of a, well, anti ofarian rascal, we are going in via the exit. So, as we go up, watch your step, Josh. We will find the entrance hatch and we will take some lights with us as well because it is quite dark in there. Now, as we jump inside of the Sunderland, quick reminder that, of course, if you visit the museum, you also get full access to the lower deck. But like I said, the cockpit and the upper deck is an exclusive here. However, I do have news for you. You too can sit in and fly a short Sunderland, virtually, of course, in War Thunder. And it is not just the Sunderland, but thousands of other aircraft. As always with sponsorships, they send you a list of talking points, which I don't care about, so out they go, because I want to tell you what I think about War Thunder, not what every other sponsorship tells you. Look, there is no other game out there that has the variety of flyable aircraft spanning from interwar all the way to the World War II period with the BF-109, the short Sunderland and the B-17, over then to, of course, the Cold War planes like the F-14 Tomcat, the MiG-21 or the Mirage 3. And they even have voodoo machines. And then if you are so inclined, you can also drive targets, you know, those things that other people call tanks or ships. War Thunder is fantastic fun if you just want to sit back and teach others not to get in your way. I especially enjoy their mixed battle experience where I drive around in targets and then I upgrade my life experience by taking control of an aircraft to provide some good old close air support. War Thunder constantly adds new planes, voodoo machines and targets like, well, tanks, APCs and ships. And then, of course, you can play on PC like a true connoisseur, or if you want to join the fun via PlayStation or Xbox, you can do that as well. It features cross-platform integration. Signing up is completely free, and if you use my exclusive sign-up bonus in the description, and actually I just noticed that makes this video a double exclusive, a Sunderland cockpit and a special reward for all of you. But yes, if you use my exclusive sign-up bonus in the description, you get a free premium vehicle, three days booster, and an exclusive channel logo. So welcome to the inside of the Sunderland. It does get just slightly cramped. First off, what we have in front of me here is the bomb aimer uh, section, of course, but you can also see the, uh, the placement for the three or three machine guns, as well as that there is storage area here for the anchor, a dinghy and a drogue and everything like that. Now, it's important to, uh, of course, have those drogues, by the way. What is a drogue, first of all? A drogue is essentially an underwater parachute. And you throw it off overboard and it will, because of the current, blow up and always be in line with the current, which then, as you're throwing it over, will also keep the aircraft in line with the current, which is, of course, important because you don't want it to be sideways on. Now, there is also a Perspect hatch over here that has been put in, uh, in the upper deck. We will have a look at that later on. And just to my left here, there are also stairs going up to the upper deck. Next to sort of the area that I've already talked about in the nose, uh, you also have spare parachute placements here. You have fire extinguishers, these brass uh, fire extinguishers. You will find them all over the aircraft. I won't point them out all the time because they are quite a few. Um, because you're flying missions that go, once again, upwards of 10 to 12 hours, you're also going to be, well, you know, you have a call of nature sometimes. So the gens finds itself right over there, or as, as I like to call it, the second bomb aimer position. And then as we walk through sort of this walkway, we find the first storage area. This is where typically you would find the personal effects of the crew. And as you can see, also there's a rifle rack here with four, uh, four uh, rifles that can be stored. Uh, portholes can also be opened and closed 
by uh, as per convenience you have clothes hangers here as well yeah just a typical sort of storage space you would expect to find now coming through here we then enter the wardroom now the wardroom as you can see there's enough space for potentially eight people to sit next to each other and have lunch dinner tea biscuits uh, you name it it can be done there's an ashtray just over there to the side as well and uh, this table can be folded out and uh, retracted again to make uh, way uh, up up here you can see there's a little bit of storage space again for the crew to uh, to store their personal effects as well and you also have once again those hatches on either side now those portholes not hatches portholes now we enter the galley and i'm just going to put down one of my lights here because they are getting in the way the galley first of all there is a ladder here the ladder helps the crew immediately transition up to the upper deck or a lower deck uh, depending on where you want to be going and then let's have a look at the port side here first first of all there is a watertight aerial fairing um, aerial uh, access point all the way on the bottom uh, this container here houses another drill you will find it on the port side at uh, starboard side as well uh, more parachutes over here for the crew of course an emergency exit hatch over here on some of the Sunderlands you could also find these hatches on the side for an additional 7.7 uh, .7 or 3 or 3 uh, Vickers gun as well and then here on the right hand side this is where the crew would will be preparing their sustenance right so we have an oven an oven here and a sort of a, a hob uh, as well for, for some light cooking. You have some storage space. For example, the Sunderland also came with two five gallons uh, containers of fuel, five gallons, that is 11 liters. So double that, 22 liters of water, fresh water supply for the crew, um, 22 liters. That makes roughly, well, that makes roughly 40 pints of water. You weren't thinking of beer, were you? Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's the galley. That uh, that is where the food would be prepared. And then we come, of course, to the area that everybody likes to talk about, and that is the bomb storage bay. What you have in the Sunderland is, of course, if we perhaps have a look at the left-hand side here with the uh, with the depth charges that are already mounted, you can see that they're being mounted on rails. First of all, these, uh, these rail mountings, there's four on either side, and the maximum weight that could be put on those is 1,000 pounds collectively. So four bombs should not go above 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds is roughly 450 to 500 kilograms, right? These rails, as you can see, could also be moved inside of the aircraft, and they sort of meet here, the port and the starboard ones meet right here. And then you would take these hatches that you see on either side and you would move them up the rail and close off this section here. And the reason why you do this is, well, first of all, you don't always need to have these bombs and the mechanisms that the bombs are attached to exposed to the elements, but also it provides some advantages by being able to store the bombs or the depth charges inside of the aircraft. What you're essentially doing is reducing the effect of drag on the aircraft and that makes it better for takeoff or you know, for top speed even that you're flying at or uh, even in terms of range that has its advantages. And as soon as you spot a German submarine, well, out they go and away they go. And if you score a hit, the submarine goes down. If not, well, you can have a second try because what the Sunderland also has is next to these eight depth charges that could already be mounted in their mounting points, you could have additional depth, depth charges four on either side, so one cycle of reload stored right here and those being put back up. Now that's not something that was done on every mission because you've got to remember that thousand pounds over there, roughly thousand pounds plus here, and then another two, uh, 2,000 pounds being stored, that is 4,000 pounds of weight, which is quite a bit. And that is also, of course also going to reduce the range of the aircraft. But if you wanted to, if you're uh, flying with additional, with additional, um, uh, bomb loads, um, then you could do that. To give you a visual representation of how the ordnance was deployed, here is a scene from Warfunner that shows it. This is greatly sped up, more of an approximation of what I would assume the real life speed would be. So yeah, it's just for visual representation, but it's really neat. 
That said, I did try to find some information on how quickly these depth charges could be deployed. Uh, first of all, loaded and then deployed, but I did not find any. If you have some information on that, I would be very happy to take a look. First of all, what we are seeing here is another bunk, another ashtray and another bunk here for people to rest and recuperate. And then as we move up here towards the tail section, we enter what is affectionately known as the workshop. So on the one hand side, we, you would have tools here and uh, ability to fabricate some you know, lighter, lighter parts that might be required. For example, if you took some battle damage, the crew was generally equipped with uh, with uh, some sort of sheets metals or uh, some sort of adhesives as well in order to plug as many holes as possible because of course you don't necessarily want to land in a Sunderland with holes in the bottom part of the aircraft. But uh, that could be done by the crew in flight and if the damage was that as ex more extensive than that they could also land and generally already send out signals before that that they would have to be pulled on to land as quick as possible. The Sunderland will stay above the water until essentially two rooms, and these rooms, by the way, have watertight doors between them, um, or not really watertight doors, but they have these sort of squash doors, which prevent a certain accumulation of water of swapping over to the next room. Um, if two rooms are fully submerged, that, at that point, the Sunderland is actually going to go down. So she can take a lot of water before, before she sinks. What you can also see in the back here is some storage area for, for example, parachute flares. Uh, you would uh, store dinghies here, dro um, not drogues this time, just the dinghies, sometimes propellers as well. You see paddles there that have been placed by the museum to show some of the uh, storage that would be happening. Uh, you have the repeater compass as well. And then of course, you can see the walkway all the way to the back of the aircraft with the turret. And sometimes this section would also be separated from that rear section with a sort of cloth sheet. Uh, with a cut out uh, door as well right on the top we see some some lighting uh, some light holes in order to pr bring some natural light and then these beam positions these beam positions would generally watch your stare uh, these uh, beam positions would generally be used to mount uh, 50 cal machine guns so you could mount one on either side right in here for some additional defense and of course here on the port side we have the exact same business additional parachutes here and so forth and that really rounds up, up here on the lower deck now let's go up now we have to do a little bit of a switcheroo here because josh has to come forward i have to go to where you were standing just in a second ago and then we are going up that way this is going to involve some aerobatics so here we go once again, big thank you also to the Royal Air Force Museum for actually opening up this section. This is not accessible to the public. If you come to the museum, please do not go up there and uh, uh, you will discover it together with me now. As I'm climbing through this compartment now, I want to mention two important things. First of all, a big, big thank you here to the RAF Museum for giving me access to this part of the aircraft. This is not your typical inside the cockpit episode. I've been working with them for a long time to make this specific aircraft possible. It's a very special exception and thus also an exclusive. I am informed that no one filmed this part of the plane for a long, long time due to conservation and health and safety precautions. So I really appreciate that the RAF Museum has made this possible. And that brings me to the second point. I was restricted to 30 minutes up there to film for health and safety purposes, uh, which is why I will first give you a quick tour for some orientation, and then we will jump into a detailed explanation of the different crew positions. So what we have here is the amplifying unit. Okay. So that must be attached to the radio set control unit. Have a look, a closer look at that later on. Stowage babs, bags for bomb carriage traversing handle, flap motor turning handle. And then we have another tank here. Some hydraulical equipment, this must be linked to that. It's actually quite fun discovering a plane together with the audience rather than already knowing what to expect. We have the radio transmitter unit. All right. Okay. Now I'm going to have to switch around and move this way. This really is tight and confined towards the cockpit. Right. 
then arriving in the midsection of the aircraft, of the upper deck. I will just hasten a quick reminder here. This perspex window would of course not exist. That would be an empty space for this hatch. Uh, and it's for you to go up and down. This of course could be closed uh, in terms of uh, the galley being used. Uh, I'm just gonna remind Josh as well not to step on it because otherwise the video is going to take a very sudden and violent end. Now, what we have here is more radio equipment, but on the right-hand side here, as I navigate around this window, we have the flight engineer station, which of course includes sort of the, uh, the uh, information on the engines in terms also of the, the oil uh, and the fuel temperature, uh, the engine temperatures as well, of course, also of the fuel content. So you can see the fuel tanks here per side. We have the starboard rear, en uh, rear tanks, we have the uh, starboard front tanks, and the same thing here for the port side as well. The oil temperatures, or the engine temperatures here first, outer, inner, inner, outer, and the same for the oil, of course. You can see right here. And then we see coolers, air shutters. Of course, you have oil cooling and just the outlets for the engine. Usually the red should be for the oil, whereas the green should most likely be. I'm not quite sure why that is here. I'm gonna put that into a bin. Main feed, overload. Might those be actually the fuel cocks? No, the cocks are over here. Okay, those are the cocks. Also, no, it's color coded by engine. Ah, this is clever. Okay, so the green ones must be the starboard engines and the red one must be the um, port engines. Okay, interesting. Yeah, outer, inner, inner, outer, trailing edge, tank outlets. Okay. Interesting. Now, another short moment of acrobatic coming in. I'm getting old. All right, radio operator position right here. With one of the main transceiver, transmitter and receiver units. Morse code. You also see uh, lots of luggage standing up here. And then we, what we have over here is the radar operator station. And this station over here, I believe, was mainly for the navigator who would then, you know, you could see, you already see some true compass, the uh, Peter compass there. You have the altitude, you have the speed as well. And then you have this table here to do any sort of calculation and tracking on a map. And then we are in the cockpit area. There we go. There's another Perspex window over here. We have to be a little bit careful about that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to jump inside of the pilot seat. I'm allowed to do that, thankfully. Thank you very much, RAF Museum. This is an absolute dream come true. Although I don't have a parachute, so this is a little bit uncomfortable. Ugh. And I'm slightly too large for this aircraft as well. There we go. I'm in a Sunderland with you. <laughs> awesome. Now let's go through the main crew positions in some detail. I will take you through the flight engineer, radar and wireless operator positions and then we will go through the main cockpit. Let's first start with the flight engineer's position. All the way on the top you will find the oil dilution selector and push buttons. Arranged in such a fashion that the rear fuel tank indicators are set above the frontal ones, the five fuel tank indicators in either wing have their own gauges. Fuel pressure warning lights and the cylinder head temperatures and oil temperatures are found in the central position of this flight engineer's panel. And the oil pressure gauges are found to either side, set above the propeller, the ISO controls and the vacuum pump selectors. 
And then the fuel cocks are operated by five levers to either side, with the sixth one and the sixth most inner levers operating the carburetor air intake control. Carburetor de-iso selection cocks and hand pumps are set to the left of the main gauges. And then an APU refueling pump, so the auxiliary power units refueling pump, is set all the way to the starboard side of the aircraft, or rather, of course, the left side of the flight engineer's uh, sitting position. Then let's move on to the radar operator. The Sunderland had a variety of air-to-surface vessel radar sets installed over their service. I don't know when the one that we see here was installed, perhaps during its service or after to complete the museum's exhibit. So let's take it as a representation of the real thing. As far as I can tell, we have, what we have here is an ASV Mark III, which is essentially identical to the H2S Mark II, with the main big difference being to the antenna system and its coverage angles. Mind you, these radar sets have quite a story for themselves, so if you have any additional detailed information about what you see here, send it my way or post a comment below. I know radar sets have quite an enthusiastic fan base, so it would be great to hear from you to extend my own understanding of them. Also, YouTube members and Patreons, as a thank you to all of you, I'll link to a few manuals for the radar sets, so be sure to check out the community tab and the Patreon feed to get those. Starting on the top, we have a sideways mounted switch unit. The three push buttons on top are the power buttons to turn the set on. This is done in stages. With the middle button LT on, first pressed, you wait 30 seconds for the circuits to meet the uh, required temperature. And then you press HT on. The visual indicator lights show the set is ready then, with a red light illuminating after about 60 seconds after the, L, uh, the HT on is pressed. To turn the set off, press LT off to the left. Below the lights, you have your gain and 10 mile zero control. The latter basically allows you to translate slant ranges to ground ranges, thus accounting for distance measuring errors and distortions at ranges of less than 10 miles. Below these, the Lucero and range switch. Lucero enables you to use ground beacons on other frequencies than the native set for distance, bearing and height measurements. A scanner and heading switch are to the bottom with a dimmer switch to the left. All the way to the right, we have the range drum with a movable pointer and the range and height control are offset to the right out of view. These also operate the height drum to the left. The left side of the drum is in a 30 mile scale, the right hand side in a 100 mile scale. The main drum for accuracy purposes is at 10 miles. Any other screw controls you see here or on other sets in the future are for the mechanics and maintenance crews only. Moving on to the PPI or indicator set. The main feature here of course is the PPI itself, so that's the plan position indicator. Here you can see a representation of the return, although this does come from an H2S manual for overland operations, as you can see, but it still gives you a general idea of what it might look like, although it doesn't show sea clutter distortions in this, uh, in this picture. That's a whole other story. The PPI is where the radar operator would scan the ocean surface to engage in that cat and mouse game with access shipping and especially German U-boats that, depending on the year, equipment and frequency, would also be carrying equipment to warn them of radar transmissions, and thus they might in fact have early warning from approaching Sunderlands. To the immediate left, you find the mixer control indicator and its control, as well as the brightness control of the PPI. And the row of controls to the bottom of the PPI are from the left here, the contrast, the shift, and the uh, tuning uh, switches and the slightly offset switch is as far as I understand for the lamp of the PPI. The lowest indicator is the high tube with a brightness control to its right. A visual representation of the return display is shown here in the picture. Moving on then to the wireless operator who operates well the wireless or radio as we would say nowadays. For this he has a T1154 transmitter and R1155 receiver set. The wireless set is connected to the directional finding antenna as well. You'll remember that one from earlier. 
and the uh, directional finding visual indicator is also found to the right of the co-pilot. The wireless operator also controls the aerial switch and the control winch for the antennas. Now let's go through the receiver and transmitter. First, the R1155 receiver is set to the left. On it, you will find the master switch set to the right to switch between all or select frequencies. Then we have the frequency range switch allowing you to select between HF and MF frequencies. So that's high frequency and medium frequency. And the latter is used for directional finding. You will find, of course, the switch to the left. The tuning indicator allowing you then to scrub through the frequency range is found in the middle. The volume control is set to the left with switches for the balance, low frequency filter and the amplitude set above it. Finally, top right, the sensitivity switch for low sensitivity when homing in on a beacon, as well as the high sensitivity when taking a bearing off a beacon, as well as the oral switch for the oral directional finding. Then we have the T1154 transmitter with a lot of colorful tuning wheels. And this is of course set to the right of the receiver. On the bottom, you will find the master switch and frequency range selector. There are three ranges in the set known as, well, range one, two, and three. One and two are high frequency, HF, and three is medium frequency, MF. The color code is of course intended as it links the master tuners on the left with the tap switches and output tuners on the right. Blue and red are range one and two. Yellow is range three for that directional finding. Each master tuner has eight preset frequencies corresponding to the letters on the tuner and oscillation dial. In case of blue, we have here A through G or rather H, which is indicated as three. The same can be set on the output tuner. The tap switches connect the aerial to the set range. As you can see, yellow has an additional one for 34 positions in total. The two dials on the top are the milliameter, indicating 0 to 300 milliamps for high frequency, and the ammeter, indicating 0 to 3.5 amps for medium frequency. Then finally, we move over to the navigator position. He has a chart table. No, of course there's more. The table helps with tracking maps and so on, but it can also be stored. It used to be on the starboard side of the cabin, but was moved here with the installation of the radar set. A bearing compass is provided. And then we have a ground position indicator mounted above the char table. This is a projector with a compass arrow being projected onto the map. You can see how a specific map scale is required for this. It helps also to account for the influence of the wind. The two larger controls on the left are wind scales, and above this, the master switch. And then we have the wind speed and direction indicator that can be adjusted via the wheels to the right. And the course indicator is adjusted similarly as far as I know. Now this engine starting control panel is mounted to the starboard side or the right hand side of the wireless operator and it sits above the doorway that separates the uh, flight engineer's position from the frontal cabin and it is found just below the Astrodome. The Astrodome itself no longer features on this aircraft. I don't know exactly when it was demounted but as you can see its old position is still here just above that entry hatch to the cockpit. To the top of this control panel then you have the booster coil switches, the fuel booster pump and the pump master switches. You can also find the fuel pressure warning lights here. The priming pumps and the selector cocks for the individual engines on each wing, well port wing and starboard wing of each port and starboard wing uh, are set just below this. As always I will move on over from the port side over to the central instrument board and then I go on to finish it off on the starboard side. On the port side, so to the left of the pilot, we find the following switches. We have the radio demolition switch. To the right, the autopilot control levers and control switches together with the pitot tube heaters. And below this, from the left, you have the bomb fusing switches, the bomb carriage indicator lights, as well as the bomb selector panel. 
two jettison buttons for the bombs and bomb containers round off the weapon controls. In front of the pilot, you find your basic six. You have the airspeed indicator, the attitude indicator, the vertical speed indicator, the altimeter, the directional gyro, and the turn and slip indicator. Below this, you find the downward identification light switch and the navigational and recognition light switches. Your main compass is in front of the control yoke. Towards the top of the instrument board, the flap indicator lights, the flap control selector, and that is accompanied by a flap position indicator. And below this, you will find the radio altimeter as well as the distance reading compass repeater. The signaling and landing light switches are found just to the left of the throttles. Moving over to the central instruments, on the top, the engine ignition switches for either side with the mixture indicator lights set in the middle. And below these, you will find your four RPM gauges for the engines, arranged in the appropriate sequence from the left to the right or port to starboard. The same applies to the engine boost gauges. Fire warning lights and the CO2 fire extinguisher push buttons are found just below this. In earlier variants, these would typically be found to the left and above the pilot. The propeller feather push buttons are set in a row just above the starter buttons. The throttles are arranged with four levers, each corresponding to the respective engine. Mixture levers are below these, just above the propeller speed control levers. Moving to the co-pilot station, we will find a much more simplified setup. A radio altimeter limiter, an airspeed indicator, an altimeter, as well as a turn and slip indicator round off the basic instruments. Then a vertical balance indicator for the aircraft is found below these. All the way on the starboard side, you will find that the directional finding indicator that I mentioned earlier. Now this appears of course quite simple, but we are not just done yet. Above the two stations, you will find additional indicators and controls. First, the master fuel cocks for the engines are found up front here as well. The elevator trim wheels are next to those with a separate handle for either pilot. A rudder trim control is found in the central position. As you can see, these are set in such a fashion that either pilot can operate them. Fuel jettison controls are also found all the way in front. And then we have a long horizontal rudder trim indicator in the central position, while an elevator trim indicator is set to either side of it, allowing both the pilot and the co-pilot to read the indication that is set there. And that brings us to a close on the Sunderland's interior. For a massive plane of this size, the relative simplicity of the cockpit itself might be surprising. However, as we saw, there's more to it than that because we also have that separate flight engineer, navigator, radar operator, and wireless operator position inside the cabin as well. All right, so I hope that you enjoyed that tour of the short Sunderland. I certainly did, especially discovering this upper part with all of you. So as always, um, also, if you like this sort of content, do consider checking out Patreon the channel memberships. I know that everybody always keeps on going on about these things, but that is in fact the support that su sustains and supports the series. So if you enjoy these sort of videos, do consider supporting via those two platforms. And to the ones that of course do, thank you very much. You are keeping this series alive. And as always, I wish all of you a great day and spend some time with your friends and family. Go out there, discover the world. And of course, come to the RAF Museum as well, because it's a place that deserves to be visited. As always, have a good one and see you in the sky.